Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Private Property Farming Podcast. My name is Mbali Nwoko, your host, every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Thank you so much for continuing to support the podcast. It's been great to have you guys, um, you know, taking part in our competitions. And I specifically liked the Know Your Crop campaign or competition that we ran uh, a few weeks ago. You know, it's great, it's great to know that people out there are really planting, growing their own food and know a little bit more than their crop than we tend to think. So today we have another amazing, amazing episode and our topic is all about financing. How do we use technology um, uh, to finance our agricultural businesses? Um, how does it work in the agricultural supply chain? So if you're looking for financing or just ways to think of how you could use technology or broaden your, your perspective on how you can farm your agribusiness or your farm enterprise, I think this conversation is for you because we have an expert to unpack this topic tonight. But before I get into the show, I just want to mention that the gardening series, which we air every once a month towards the end of the month, um, we've partnered with Echo Buzz. So the private property and the gardening series with the gardening series show, we've partnered with Echo Buzz to give away a nurture products hamper. Um, so you can enter this competition by telling us what you have learned since the first episode of the gardening series. So if you if you miss any of the episodes, go onto our YouTube channel, uh, Private Property Farming Podcast Playlist, and catch up on the past episodes that we've aired on the gardening series and share with us what you have learned using the hashtags, hashtag gardening series, hashtag echo buzz, hashtag private property to better your chances of winning. So please connect, engage, share and like our videos. It's always great to have your feedback. So let's get on to tonight's guest. Tonight we are joined by Helmut Druis, who is the founder of Contagra. And we're gonna be speaking about using technology to finance the agricultural supply chain. Helmut, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. Great, great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Likewise, thank you for coming on to the podcast. So as a means of introduction on the podcast, we first start off with the conversation basically on you introducing up, introducing yourself to us and maybe giving us a bit of more insight on what does Contagra do? Yeah, um, thanks everybody. Um, so Contagra effectively uh, administers a credit marketplace um, for supply chain finance, um, and that rewards farmers for sustainable farming practices. Um, so, so we work on a, a specific platform that gives farmers access to certain markets. Um, and then as part of that structure that he's uh, supplying to a market, we then provide the financing. And the financing is linked to what he actually does on his farming enterprise. So it does two things. First of all, it makes additional capital available to the farmer, but also secondly, it's a way of actually recognizing what farmers actually do and how those effects and on those practices impact the food production. Right, right. So maybe just give us an example of that. It sounds quite interesting. I've never heard of this form of uh, financing as well as linking yeah. to market. So I could be a maize farmer and I'm coming to Contagra. Um, what am I looking for? Am I looking for production input finance? And with that, would you assist me yeah. to sell my maize? Sure. So I think maybe to take a step back to explain what, what I, I see as the different forms of finance available to farmers. Um, I think the traditional form of financing agricultural production is based on a system that's called uh, balance sheet financing. But effectively what it is, is that uh, the, the, the bank or the financier would look at the, the balance sheet of the farmer um, and, you know, in, in which effectively is the land. So if he owns land and that land has got some value and what the bank says is, okay, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take that value and a certain percentage of that will make to, available to you as, as cash, you know. So you're effectively converting your asset into short-term cash, so a long-term asset that's being converted into cash. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the problem with that system is, number one, is that if you don't have that asset, there's no way you can get financing. Um, and we see that specifically in South Africa, we have through our political history, 
uh, certain regions where you don't own title and it's actually makes it unfinanceable. So that's why farmers uh, in those, uh, you know, sort of former homelands are finding it difficult to raise financing because there's no asset that it could be converted in terms of a, a, a in terms of converting it into cash. So that's the sort of traditional form of financing. There's an alternative, which would, would, what I would call is uh, a retail credit. And that's effectively um, where uh, the person or the company that's supplying you with inputs says to you, look, um, we'll, we'll provide you your inputs and then you can repay me when you harvest. You know, so that's traditionally what the models that, that the cooperative would use to say, listen, you know, you've, you've got an account with a cooperative and then you can go buy seeds and fertilizers from us. And then when you harvest, you repay us. Now, now the problem with that, first of all, is, is that you sort of almost locking yourself into a specific um, buying relationship so that you, you're buying from a single supplier and, and there's a certain sort of business cost to doing that. But I think the, the biggest problem with that system is, is that you're effectively are forced to sell your produce at the time of harvest mm. um, to settle your credit. And which means you, and, and like you probably know from, from experience, that market prices go up and down and they usually go down when it's harvest time because that's when everybody is, is producing. Mm. So it, in, in a way, it, it strips the farmer the opportunity to actually participate in a longer term market and actually re-leverage the ability to, to um, participate where the market prices go up again. Um, what we do is, is, is different. We, we start at the market. So we say, listen, okay, well, um, who's buying a specific product? And, and, and that's, it's interesting that like agriculture, the, the, I think the major major driver of the industry is to, to push farmers to produce more and more and more, uh, mm. which is sort of this negative cycle of producing commodities at scale. You know, So the only way you can win is by producing more of the same stuff. And then everybody does it. And by doing that, the actual price comes down. So that's, mm. that, that's one way of doing it. But there's another way of doing it is to say, listen, well, let's, let's start uh, – making agriculture produce that it's got some quality to it you know it's, it's a different strategy it's like in the car industry you can either try and be a large volume let's call it i don't want to abuse any brands but like, like something like a, a company that would be a like toyota or volkswagen that produces at scale at a low cost point and then at the other spectrum you've got the ferraris and the porsches who are differentiating themselves on the driving experience for instance so in agriculture you could have a similar approach so if you look at let's produce agricultural produce that has got certain characteristics and that could be the product itself but i think increasingly over time it's also how it was produced so mm -hmm. Does the product, you know, when you're buying a bag of, of, of maize, where was it produced and what was the social impact of that bag, you know? So was it produced locally? Was it shipped from Brazil or was it produced locally? Um, is it organic? Is, is it GMO free? Um, there's a whole lot of sort of characteristic or product characteristics you can add to agricultural products. But anyway, we start there and listen, to call that has a market value. And what effectively we, we try and do is then to advance the funds to the farmer based on certain events happening, okay? And if you, if you look at it, so if you, for instance, have produced something of value and you're invoicing your buyer, then that's got a certain value. So that's one part where you could say, well, that's financeable. And you could say, listen, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finance based on that future value. Another event is when you've actually delivered your crop you know, um, when you've delivered it across the way bridge, there's already value that was being created. So we could say, well, that event is another event where we could potentially advance funds on to say, listen, let's finance you based on what you've delivered. And then you can actually go further in time to say, listen, okay, well, once you've harvested something, if you've recorded that, to say, listen, okay, I've actually harvested a crop. And, uh, and there's different ways of recording that thing. There's always modern technologies that are being developed. And that's, I think, our topic today. So, for instance, combine harvesters that have yield sensors on that's data that we could potentially say, well, that crop has been harvested, so value has been created, which makes it value, which makes it financeable. But you can go in time further and further upstream, if I can call it that. So, if we can, for instance, validate that the crop is growing, for instance, you know, so if there's a clear satellite image that says this crop is growing, then that's also a, a traceable event using technologies. And you could say, well, we'll advance funds based on the crop growing. And you can go further by saying when that crop has been planted. So um, technologies help us to do a couple of things. First of all, it allows us to record these events in agriculture. Mm. Um, and, but I think most importantly, for what we try, we're trying to do is to combine it with the financing. And by doing that, 
we believe we can create, um, we can make financing available uh, to, to new and emerging farmers and growing farmers that don't necessarily have the balance sheet to finance the operation. Um, right. So that, that's in short what we're trying to do. <clears throat> yeah, so forgive me, if, you know, my yeah. question, you see mundane, it's quite technical what you're saying. And yeah. I'm trying to put it into perspective as a farmer on the ground, you know. So um, what I hear you saying is that you provide financing at every, maybe at, at, at you provide financing to farmers, but look at, at every single value chain or step of production yes. where value has been created and you could finance on that, right? Exactly. So now the farmer hasn't started, you know, they've got a thousand hectares, they want to start producing maize, but maybe uh, they just need production input costs to buy the seeds and the fertilizers. Yes. Um, and they have, a, uh, they have a market, meaning uh, an XYZ company that's going to take their maize. So can the farmer come through to Contegra and say, I need, for example, 1 million to farm my 1,000 hectares because my maize is going to go to X person? Um, it, it, or do you need the farmer to already be in production so that you it can equate some sort of value towards the financing that they need? Uh, yeah, so the, so, so the quick answer, that that's, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. So listen, if you've got a contract, so somebody's prepared to buy your product and that has value you know so so, so the, the the idea would be to say listen okay well if you're selling this crop to this buyer and he's prepared to buy it from you then then that has value yes. and then effectively what happens then is listen okay well then we need to fund your business because remember your buyer now has a vested interest in you producing what he needs for his market does it make sense so we we're trying to incentivize that this thing is actually about producing something of value as opposed to looking at what you have at the moment. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we're saying we're not going to look at you in terms of what balance sheet you have and what land you own, but in terms of what you're producing. And, and I think that's exciting because that could change and unlock the potential of Africa because if there's a lot of potential, what we can achieve as opposed to what we have. And, and we're trying to turn that model around. So if you have an agreement to sell, then that's got value. And it's about actually then organizing that and, and setting it up and to make it work. I mean, I was just... When you asked that question, um, I was just thinking about like maybe to explain it from a from a different business. Like um, let's take for instance a hair salon. Yeah. You know, a hair salon that says, okay, I need to I need money to grow. Let's say I, I need what does a hair salon need? It needs a chair, it needs razor blades. <laughs> it's got a, it's got operational expenses, electricity. A mirror, well. yeah. Aircon. Okay, mirror. There we go. Now we're going a sort of a capital <laughs> expense, but let's say. But you need you need you need ongoing you know working capital to make it work. So now when you start off, we can say that you can go to your your family and friends and say, listen, please lend me the money so I can start this this um this this barber shop. And then uh, then you start going and you start getting customers, you know. Um, but you'll sort of also realize after time that you need more money. You know, you need to grow. You want to get additional chairs into your barber shop, or uh, and that costs money. So now a, a, a hair salon. Is, is from a financing perspective a relatively easy because you do a monthly sort of business. It's like every month you've got so many customers that come through your door and you, you, you look after them and then you treat them and then they go out and that sort of repeats itself. So when you look at that from a financing perspective, you can say, well, that's an ongoing business. What makes agriculture hard is because you've got these massive call them working capital cycles. Like you said, you, you know, it takes two months, let's say you use the example of grain production, it takes two months to prepare and to plant and to fertilize and everything. And then you've got four or five months of the crop growing, and then it takes another month or two months to actually harvest the crop and then move it to a storage facility. So you've got this massive drawdown, which makes it unique. But it goes further than that. You must remember that to supply you, there's an input supplier who needs another 12 months before you to actually get themselves organized to supply you with inputs, you know? And the crop that you've sold takes 12 months until that last uh, bag of, of maize meal has been sold, if that makes sense. So it's actually a very long supply chain. And to manage these cycles, it, I think it needs a fresh approach on how you actually finance it. And that's what makes agriculture different, but also in that sense, exciting. <laughs> Yeah. And with the Contagra's value add and model, you know, basically your unique value proposition, um, traditional forms of financing would need, like you said, balance sheet, maybe would need the land as an asset, you know, the title yes. deed, 
what sort of what form of security uh, do you guys take when you're financing a farmer? Because again, we also very know we know very well how much that you know. Um, as much as a, a farmer might have an, a, a, a contract and so forth, some of them are not binding, you know, because clients can chop and change those contracts um, based on seasonality as it suits them. So, um, how do you protect yourself as Contagra in that space where um, you have to finance a farmer? And maybe what from a farmer, what what is it that you will need from the farmer in terms of, um, I suppose, equity or uh, uh, security? Yeah if you are working with that model. Yeah. So, so I think it, it, you've actually hit the money or the nail on the head, if I can call it that, is that it, you, the conversation is, and this is the correct decision, it's moved towards that offtake and his credit worthiness. Do you understand? Uh, you, you've just shifted it to say, um, you, you know, the farmer does everything he can to produce, um, but we actually rely on, on that buyer that being ethical and, and honoring his, his contract. So in a certain way, that's the first step in our process is to assess that what we call that off taker, you know, to make sure that he's, he's got a certain uh, a brand promise to the consumer. And I think it starts there is to say, we no longer are just going to produce commodities, but there's somebody out there that's saying, listen, okay, I have a responsibility in terms of my supply to me, and I'm committing to actually provide a product to the market, to the consumer that I'm tying myself to. Okay, so there's, there's that first step. I think that's key to this whole process. It's not guys just trading and being intermediaries. It's, it's companies that say, listen, we want to build certain supply chains. You know, coming back to the car analogy, um, there's a certain commitment that the car brand makes to the driver to say, listen, we will do everything in our ability to make sure this car is safe as an example. It's, it's a similar kind of thinking we need to bring into agriculture is that off-takers actually have a promise towards the consumer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it starts there. Now, in terms of what we require, so that's the first step that we need. There's a, in terms of the, like, let's say there's, there's managing the harvest downstream, you know, that's tangible. You know, you, you, you can put stuff into a silo, you, you can take it to a pack house, you can freeze the apple. So, Usually that's that's not the hardest part. You have risks around that, but the big headache is really this part from when the farmer has invested into the production until there's something of value. And that could be a tree that's growing fruit. It could be a field crop that's still you know uh, germinating. And then it could also be livestock, for instance, a calf that needs to be reared and and uh, before it's ready for market. So, so that middle section is where the bis- big risks lie. And there's many of those. There's the you know, the, the, the sort of incidental risks we call them, that's the stuff that happens that you can't do anything about. It's like um, fire and theft and, you know, it's beyond all of the farmer. And those are usually covered by insurance. So a big part of what we do is to make sure that that insurance is in place. So there's a sort of a, a control, a checklist that we make sure that all this stuff is ticked off. And then the second uh, sort of risk that is there is what we call systemic risks, which are effectively risk that the farmer carries if he's used to carrying himself, which is effectively weather, you know? So if you, for instance, have like a shortage of rainfall or there's excessive drought or there's too much water, you know, which in some industry, that's another concern, then that risk is usually carried by the farmer. And that's usually this, this cycle that you go through over the years. You Some years you do well, some years you don't do well. Now, in most cases, farmers carry that themselves. But in our case, because remember, we're funding that, that part, we need to make sure that that's mitigated. So we're working with, uh, uh, you know, reinsurers to make sure that that underlying risk is actually mitigated. And that's partly what we do with our technologies is that we, we put all this data together to make sure that that production risk is, call it, bankable, you know, so that you can quantify it, you can calculate it and say, okay, right, fine, then somebody is prepared to buy that risk so that the farmer doesn't carry it. And what it effectively also creates a vehicle for the farmer then to protect his own balance sheet. And it's kind of this idea that, you know, you, know, you, you, you build up something of value and then in the 10th year, you have a bad yield and all of a sudden you're back to zero and you have to start up again. And I think a lot of sort of emerging farmers are on this kind of like trap where they're trying to get into this market, but they, they build up value or they build up some, some equity and then all of a sudden they just get clapped out and they, they, they've lost out. So we're trying to mitigate that because it's all about sustainability. And then the third risk that we need to manage is the actual farmer's behavior. Because remember, there's a risk that the farmer doesn't commit to what he said he will do. You know? 
And that's an interesting topic in itself, because, um, you know, how do you do that? So first of all, and I believe it's really important that we start recognizing what farmers are actually doing. And um, we, we sort of doing some initial investigations into, you know, regenerative agriculture, which, which addresses the topic of, first of all, soil health. So a, a farmer that's looking after his soil, in a way, you can trust that he can start looking after your supply contract, as an example, okay? Because he's really, he's got a view on his business being sustainable. A farmer that looks after his livestock, for instance, is also somebody that's a leading indicator of somebody that's investing into his production system and, and recognizing that because at the moment, Mark, the market doesn't really recognize that value that, that, that he's doing. And then thirdly, um, is also his social impact, you know, and, and it's something we, we probably don't, uh, you know, link to agricultural produce, you know. So when you're buying a, a bag of apples or you're buying a, a bag of something, uh, you don't really recognize, like, you know, there's actually a very important component to how it was produced. Mm. Um, you, you know, we, we've had the fortune that we, we sort of been working in, in, in Europe, and, and it's a massive trend at the moment, this whole, this whole desire to move towards more sustainable production systems, you know, that we have, that we're no longer just looking at the least cost way of getting food to Europe. It's about making sure that that food that's being produced is ethically produced, um, you know, all those kind of attributes that come into it. So I think it, we also try and in our system recognize what the farmer is doing. Um, and then actually that's part of the whole whole sort of compliance model so that we, we, we can work on, so listen, a certain farmer that does this, we can start creating incentives to say, listen, well, if your soil conditions start improving, then that increases your credit worthiness, which then we, we can recognize and actually advance in terms of funding. So, so we kind of like, you know, my sort of opening statement, that's what we're trying to do. We're going to try and do supply chain financing, but really reward farmers that start farming sustainably along wow. all those various parameters. <clears throat> wow, that is quite interesting. So you walk the journey with the farmer throughout the production yeah. cycle, and you would expect the farmer to keep, obviously, accurate records on what they're doing. They must be open in their production practices to ensure that they're farming ethically. And I, I suppose it creates a beautiful incentive, like a rewards program, because yeah. then everybody, you know, could just start farming, <laughs> could start farming sustainably. Yeah, that's exactly. A good yeah. yeah, and just to also uh, verify, how much is that the financing can not only be for equipment, but can it be for production input costs? And also, I know we're looking at the emerging farmer or the farmer specifically, but um, what about those companies that are? selling maybe fertilizers to farmers but they need financing you know maybe to buy more stock etc or sure. companies that are selling let's say you, you mentioned in emerging farmers as well and we know some of the problems with that we have in the industry with emerging farmers is operational capital you know yes they might have land they might have the seeds but to keep the business going some of them don't have those resources yeah. so um you know and a lot of the companies, let's say you might need a knapsack, a sprayer, some form of tools to continue your farming, and the farmers don't have that capital. Like, mm. do you provide financing to those input suppliers that supply the knapsacks to the farmers to say, okay, you know, I could be one of them, that person. I can say, Helmut, I've got 100 knapsacks, you know, retailing, let's say, 2,000 yeah. rand each, but I've got 50 farmers that want to buy it, but they don't have the cash. Um, yeah. So... It, can your form of financing also be part of this? Um, can, a, can a supplier come through to, um, to Contagra for, for, for some financing? Yeah, so I mean, the, the short answer to that is actually, we actually tie the supply into the whole process. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the sort of pre-season funding is, is not dispersed as cash. Uh, effectively, as the farmer has, has the ability to purchase from accredited suppliers who then, you, you know, supply them with the goods. Um, so, so exactly that. We try and also remove the credit risk for the input supplier. And by doing that, obviously, then it unlocks other opportunities in terms of, uh, you know, offering benefits to the farmer in terms of price, for instance, you know, so in terms of a volume rebate. So that's that, that's the short answer. I think also uh, I just wanted to maybe touch on this concept of, of, of liquidity in a way, you know. So if you look at a, a balance sheet, uh, you, you know, to not not to simplify it and uh, too much, but you know, you've got you've got the sort of what you call a long term asset, which is typically your land and your fixed improvements and so forth. Um, and then you have your sort of what they call what we would call sort of medium term or movable assets, and that would be typically your machinery, 
um, and then your your breeding livestock. Okay, so in terms of an agriculture context, and then you've got your sort of short term assets or liabilities, and that's your operating costs. Mm-hmm. Now, what what farmers probably tend to do is that they they start using their long term assets to fund their short term working capital, if that makes sense. And we weren't trying to do is try and correct that slightly. So our focus is to look at specifically the value of the material that's moving through the supply chain, if, if I can use an example. So that starts with fertilizer and diesel and seeds. It doesn't make sense. So that's the, that's the object of value that we try and quantify and, and make it bankable. And when the farmer harv- plants, you've got a growing crop. So that crop, that plant itself becomes the asset, if I understand what I'm saying. And as that plant grows, it increases in value, you know? And then when you harvest it, the fruit of the plant, you know, the commodity then in the supply chain is what's of value. It doesn't make sense. Yes. So in, in, in all the other industries, that's what that's how it works. So if you take mining, for instance, you know, the value lies in that ore that's been hauled out of the ground or the gold that's been extracted from the ore. And as you work this, call it this work in progress or this factory that's producing value, that's what happens. And actually mining companies, that's how they finance their working capital. It's just in agriculture, it's not done because of this huge drawdown and this complexity around managing it. So we're saying, well, if that's the problem, let's solve it. Let's put the structures in place. Let's get the farmers to start reporting. Let's use technologies to, to monitor this. You can you can bring trust into the system just by having the right technologies. And you know, there's exciting stuff happening in terms of blockchain to even reduce the, the risk that you 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 leverage these data just for yourself. So there's a lot of stuff one can do just to increase the trust uh, on the underlying assets. So it's really about solving the short term, call it the the working capital of the production. And maybe to answer your question, by doing that you're releasing funds where the farmer would have used those funds for his working capital. If we can give them that, that allows them to diversify and start in- investing into sort of longer term assets. Does it make sense? So we like if in a livestock example, if, if we can start financing the wiener production, for instance, and the, and the farmer gets capital released, he can start investing into breeding livestock. Well, a maize farmer might say, listen, okay, well, I've got additional capital. I'm going to reinvest it into storage, for instance, or processing. Um, you know, or a fruit farmer can diversify what he's doing with it. You know, you can, you can augment it with different revenue streams. And also, like, you know, even this, this regenerative agriculture idea of combining crops and livestock. So, so by doing that, you're unlocking the capital for the farmer to diversify. And guess what? That reduces credit risk. Because you're diversifying revenue stream, you're making the business more robust. And we believe over 10, 20 years, when the farming operation, that's how we need to have our goal on, is around succession planning. And that's really what it boils down to, is to make sure that these farming businesses are growing and then diversifying. So, you know, that's another example of how we try and really focus on the sort of long-term value for the farmer. Wow. This is definitely interesting. I mean, it's a whole (laughs) new different concept. And uh, yeah, I think we might have to have a conversation after this. Uh, okay, <laughs> just, sure. you know, there's so many things that I've, I'd like to ask, but you know, we only have about 30 minutes in this call, in this conversation. Um, sure. What I wanted to find out is what you mentioned, you know, just before we start our conversation. Um, and I think this could just wrap up our, our talk today is that you mentioned that, um, you know, you're working with some partners overseas on an accelerator program. Maybe just tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, we, we're pretty excited about it. So, so we, we're still a relatively young, young business, um, but we got accepted into a, a, an accelerator in Germany, in Hanover. Um, I don't know if you know where, where Hanover is, but Hanover is, is where the Agri-Technica is, is located, which is the world's largest technology show, like in terms of tractors and stuff and gadgets and things. It's, it's a massive it's a massive confluence and uh, around Hanover there's a quite a few companies that are it's a very strong agricultural region let's call it that almost the free state of, of Germany <laughs> if I can call it that um, and anyway so they they there's a couple of corporate partners that are looking at sort of innovative approaches to to um, agriculture like sort of leading to disruptive technology ideas and and there were 300 applications and and we were one of the seven that was chosen. Um, we're the only one that's not doing sort of the classical tech, you know, in terms of like selling gadgets to farmers. 
Um, so we sort of they have this matrix where they assess these different types of companies, and there's a there's a box at the bottom right which says other, and that's <laughs> Contagra. So so we we sort of fall into sort of sort of a sort of supply chain integration, um, you know, space, which is exciting because it and it, it's you realize that the industry is really hasn't been looking at that like how do we leverage the integration of the supply chain as opposed to just focusing on production and maximizing yields. Um, and then what we're also super excited are we're the only company that sort of, you know, originates in South Africa, you know, so there's, there's a Polish team, there's a Turkish team, there's a German team, and um, I think the last one was, um, oh, it was from Belarus, you know, so it's, it's quite cool to say, listen, hang on a minute, you know, this sort of innovative idea, she has its roots in South Africa, so, so we're very excited, it's going to hopefully open doors and, and just get this idea onto the map, and I can tell you that I was there in Germany last week, there's a there's a massive movement, and I don't think we have experienced it yet in South Africa towards this sort of this really deep desire from consumers to understand where their food comes from and the impact of that food production in terms of climate and social impact. Um, and and I think that's something we should really think about South Africa and how we export and how we present ourselves on a global scale. Um, so there's I think very exciting stuff. Anyway, so we're very excited to be part of that program. <laughs> Oh, this is fantastic, Helmut. I'm wishing all, you all the best, not only for Contagra, but for South Africa as well, because you, you are literally representing, and I think what you are offering with Contagra is quite unique. And um, yeah, hopefully you can come back onto the show, um, I don't know, next year, you know, once you've gone through the program and maybe just share your experiences, how it's been mm -hmm. like, and maybe, you know, your business model might change you know, and have more offering because there might be things that you could pick up, you know, with the other international businesses that could obviously apply to um, the farming landscape here uh, in, in South Africa. Well, all the best and congratulations for being selected. Thank you, thank you very thank you. much, Molly. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Helmut. Um, yeah, okay. Our time was short, but um, I think what you are doing is quite interesting. And I hope a lot of people could grasp what you were saying, and, and I agree, you know, traditional forms of financing must change because again, we don't farm like how we used to farm 50 years ago. There's so many facets into agri that have changed, not only in production cycle, but along yeah. the value chain. Um, exactly. And obviously technology is also helping with that. So thank you so much for, your conversa for our conversation this evening and for sharing us uh, your journey and what you do in the industry. Thank you very much. And Bali, what you're doing with this podcast is fantastic. So. To you as well congratulations and keep doing what you're doing <laughs> thank you that was Helmut Drewers from um, Contagra he's a founder of Contagra and we're speaking about how to use technology to finance the agricultural supply chain supply chain to finance your business as a farmer as an input supplier to the agri industry and what I like about Contagra is that you know there are pushing uh, farmers to farm sustainably, to farm ethically, to look after the environment and you get incentives out of that. So if you missed our conversation, please watch it on the Farming Podcast playlist under the Private Property YouTube channel. And if you have any questions for how much, drop them and we will answer them um, immediately after if you've missed this uh, this live show. So thank you so much for joining us. Remember just to hop onto the gardening series uh, uh, platform, watch the videos, um, connect and engage with us and take part in the competition that we have in partnership with Echo Buzz. There's amazing hamper waiting for you for the winner that's, that is. And so follow us on all our social media platforms and that's where you'll get more competition info. So that's it from me and I I will catch you next week, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Take care.